Hello and welcome to the Malaika Rights channel. My name is Malaika Rights and today I want to talk about modern femininity in crisis. Our unique portrayal of femininity in the West was thrown into chaos after the 1950s. After the First World, and First World War and the Second World War, the emphasis was on creating a modern utopia, the detached house with a white fence and a dog and two children was the goal of many people during the 50s and this was largely because the media pushed this image it is often highlighted as a conservative heyday the 50s a reference point for us to look back on and marvel at how great society was before feminism ruined it what is often neglected is the underpinning trauma that was behind the glorious utopia of green front gardens and community euphoria. London had been devastated by the Blitz and France was in utter ruins. Tens of thousands of men had died during the war, children had been evacuated to the countryside and women had taken to working in factories with dangerous chemicals. That was the situation during the war and after the war, these problems and changes didn't just go away. America had entered the war quite late both times and had not endured an attack of actual significance on the home front, minus Pearl Harbor. But it wasn't the Blitz, that's for sure. There's a difference between attacking a military base and dropping bombs on civilians. The US could and did recover easily from the war in terms of infrastructure and finance. To cut a long story short, there was no idyllic age of traditional femininity. For most of human history, people simply got on with it. It was the elites who had enough financial stability to contemplate the complexities of human interaction. For the vast majority of people, slaving it away in the fields for some lord who could conscript their sons for some pointless war if they didn't obey the rules, life was about survival. For women, getting into a relationship was to dance with death because childbirth could easily claim your life and there was no way of controlling that. The local wise woman could recommend a few herbs that could induce an abortion but those were often poisonous and they only worked half of the time. So why does it seem that femininity is in a worse state today than it was yesterday? The most obvious answer is that our civilization has evolved in such a way that, for the most part, the majority of people can ask questions such as, what is the meaning of life? Until recently, such questions were reserved for the elite. To understand the female nature, we must look at the tale of Persephone and her six-month cycle. For six months, she is above ground and we have summer, spring and summer. And for another six months, she is below ground. And then we have autumn and winter. Persephone's tale is about the origin of the seasons. The significance of that cycle to the feminine myth is that it illustrates feminine nature. The feminine governs the underworld, which is where all in potential springs from, the feminine is potential itself, and so she is located in the underworld. A great illustration of this can be found in The Secret Garden. It's a classical tale about a little, stuck-up, rather horrid girl who becomes a better person as she embarks on a quest to discover a secret garden that was formerly um, in the keeping of her guardian's wife, who sadly passed away. For those looking to discover more about the feminine journey, The Secret Garden is a brilliant resource. It details the journey that girls must take to become women, and the tending of that garden or that underworld lasts a lifetime, because life will constantly try and mess up the garden that you are tending. So women practice this tightrope walk of managing the inner world, which is full of chaos and potential, and the outer world with its rules and limitations which isn't kind to them. The aim is to straddle both worlds and become almost like a ghost. The Greek representation of this was Melone, who was the daughter 
of Persephone and Zeus um, or Hades, depending um, on which version you read. But the point is she represents both light and dark and she is followed around by ghosts and is quite ghostly herself in appearance. If we think about Galadriel in the Peter Jackson adaptation, she's unnatural, even more so than the other elves. And that's because she straddles the two worlds. She's a fully actualized feminine woman. When we meet her in The Lord of the Rings, she is towards the end of her journey in Middle-earth, suggesting that the ability to have one foot in either world comes with maturity and age. So it's not something a young girl can easily achieve. And we see this with the character of Eowyn in The Lord of the Rings. When we meet Eowyn, she's at that age where she wants to fight. She's brimming with the um, potential and the chaos inside her. And she's leaning more into her masculine side, which is a very important part of the feminine journey. And it's one that in modern um, Times has received a lot of um, a lot, a lot of criticism from certain circles, but I think it's due to a lack of understanding about how important it is for girls to exercise that point. Because you know, there's a saying that a wise man learns from his mistakes, but a wiser man learns from others and from the mistake of others. And a lot of people aren't that wiser man. A lot of people are the wise man. So you essentially have to make your own mistakes. And I think that part of the journey where girls lean into the more masculine side of their nature, it teaches them something because they feel very much like imposters when they're in that, um, when they're in that mind frame. But it's something they have to adopt because life isn't waiting life isn't life for a woman isn't waiting for a prince to rescue you so the first major contact a girl will usually have with womanhood is her menstrual cycle and it comes with pain and discomfort it foreshadows the sacrifice of childbirth to a young girl brimming with the desire for adventure um femininity is an oppressive cage and we have Eowyn even talk about this cage um but she frames it in old age, but it's still referring almost to this perceived weakness about femininity. So it's usually around this time um, that girls begin to hide things from their mothers because their mums come to represent this, this oppressive or, or painful time in their lives. They come to represent these the titular head of femininity itself. So girls lean more into their masculine side as we both have feminine and masculine in us all. And that's because it represents strength. It represents power. It's blunt and obvious and quite in your face. It feels more tangible. However, an excess of masculinity manifests differently in girls than it does in boys. And so the manifestation is often unpleasant. It doesn't always mean tomboy behavior, but it can also manifest in hypersexual behavior, um, a desire for male approval and, and validation. Um, a great example of this, you can, you can um, read about it in A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing. I've recommended that book before in one of my other videos. So this, so this leaning into the masculine side can last well into adulthood because the more of life that the girl experiences, the more she comes to rely on masculinity to help her get through it all. This brings us back to the issue of femininity in the modern age. The big reason why we're having such an issue with femininity is that our portrayals of femininity have largely been unable to stand up to reality. No woman, unless she is privileged enough to be born into a rich family, can afford to be the dainty princess because life will chew her up and spit her out before she can finish saying the word princess. 
Life is cruel and no woman can afford to wait around for a prince. She quite literally can't afford it. So the representation falls flat on its face. The other extreme, which is the battle-hardened, bitter and angry woman, is clearly not a good example of femininity either. So what is? The fact that we lack the answer to that question in secular culture, at least, is the very reason why femininity is in crisis. It is because we have failed to come up with an archetype of femininity that actually faces up to the trials of life here in the West. It has been left to interpretation, and so what constitutes femininity is vague, unclear, and entirely not useful. So I wanted to break down the Proverbs 31 woman because I think it offers the best working definition of femininity. So the context of this, um, this passage I'm about to read is a king giving his son advice about the type of woman he should be looking for. So it begins at verse 10. An excellent wife who can find... She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax, and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night, and provides food for her household, and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known at the gates when he, sit, when he sits amongst the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. So when we look at that passage, some things just jump out immediately, and I just want to go through a few of them before we move on. So when we, when we look at history, the general assumption, which is a crazy assumption, but the general assumption is that women didn't work and they remained at home and men went out and they gathered food. And that for me is just one of the most simple minded interpretations of history because life was far more difficult in the past than it is today because of the sheer amount of security that we have here in the West and even around the world, things have generally gotten better around the world in terms of um, human civilization and human interaction. So you can afford to have a fully grown adult at home not doing some type of work. If we look at the time that this, um, this proverb is coming from, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an old proverb. It's not something that's recent. It's definitely not from the 1950s. So what we have is a working woman. 
So she works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchants. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night. So she's not cooking during the day because there's so much work to be done during the day that she can't afford to leave the cooking till to the day. She has to, there's a lot more to do. She has to make things to be sold at the market because while men were at war, life didn't stop. People still needed to eat. Things still needed to be done. Plants still needed to be, you know, the harvest needed to be reaped. Women were workers. They didn't stay at home because there wasn't, there wouldn't be a home unless people were working. So work is praised in this proverb. And the type of woman that this king is describing to his son is a jewel. You know, he's, he's saying an excellent wife who can find. So the description that we have is of an excellent woman. It's of a fully feminine um, and self-actualized woman. You know, she's profitable. So she looks on a field and she purchases it so that suggests that women did have a certain access to money um, and they were, of course would have had to because if the man is not around, if, the, if there's a war, if men are um, away tending sheep in the fields and you wouldn't graze your sheep just a few leagues from your house, you would, gra- you would go to um, far places to graze your sheep. So we're talking you would be away for a very long time. This was reality. We're not so different from our forebears, but there's this academic snobbery when it comes to looking at the past that we sometimes think we've some were somehow better or they were stupid back then and were so enlightened. And we often think about the past in very simplistic terms. But that was not the case. And texts such as this illustrate that. So we see the primary virtues of a good woman listed. Strength of mind and body, so that's diligence and discipline, integrity, kindness, reverent behaviour and wisdom. Not all that different from the values one would expect a man to uphold. However, the difference is that she prioritises people. Women tend to be more interested in people than things and it acknowledges that here it doesn't prohibit a woman from working it praises her work it praises her the fact that her eye is keen when it comes to um, profitable investment she doesn't neglect herself but she's overflowing with generosity and kindness for other people when we look at Galadriel um, we see the influence that Tolkien drew from to create her character from the way that Galadriel offers up her home as a haven to the respect that she gives Celeborn, Galadriel is a Proverbs 31 woman. With, all, with such a beautiful and working description of a feminine woman, why is it that we have such a crisis on our hands? Well, I believe that it is for the same reason that we have a masculinity crisis. It is a general lack of discipline and diligence in the West. It is easy to wish for a bygone era and bemoan the loss of traditional societies that we would have been misfits in were we ever sent back. We daydream about the time when women were real women and men were real men, but we lack the discipline as a culture to stick to our principles when it matters. If femininity is in crisis today, then it is our fault, and the same goes for masculinity. The material is out there, but is the willingness to do anything about it in you. There's so many things that we get out of the, these passages um, when we read this um, verse about the Proverbs 31 woman. No one who comes into her household is neglected. No one who passes through her house is left unchanged. Her maidens are given food that she herself has prepared. She is not lazy. Her life is in order. She's efficient. She's diligent. She gets her work done. She knows what needs to be done. She maintains this environment, facilitates a community, and it grows. And we see this. She does not eat the bread of idleness. People speak well of her. Her reputation precedes her. And as a result, so does the reputation of the people she loves, her husband, 
her children praise her as well. It's not just her singing her praises. Other people see the result of her work. It says, give her the fruit of her hands and let her work praise her in the gates. She does not need to sing her praises. The evidence is the work that she produces. It's the community that she has facilitated the growth of. And that's her, that's in part her reward, but that's also in part her work. And what we have here is that she's observant. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She, she looks well to the ways of her house and does not eat the bread of idleness. This all speaks of somebody who observes. And when you observe, you sit quietly and you look. And this is not to say that women cannot talk. I'm doing a lot of talking here, so I would, I would be at fault if that was the case. But it's to make sure that when you are talking, it's not idle. It's not um, just senseless gossip. It's wisdom. It's nurturing. It facilitates growth. It, it's something that nourishes the other person it fulfills them you're not just spreading you're not spreading lies or you're not spreading gossip or you're not saying things that hurt other people there are ways to pass a, across the truth without being hurtful and this is what this passage is referring to this is femininity it's the facilitating of growth of people of creating communities and that is a beautiful thing and it's a shame that we have largely ignored it and degraded it and clothed femininity in stereotypes and falsehoods and perpetuated this false femininity that focuses only on looks. It says here that charm is deceitful and beauty is vain because the outward the outward appearance of femininity is obviously the beauty and there's nothing inherently wrong with looking beautiful. There's nothing inherently wrong with being charming. But if that is all that you have then you're not actually embodying the values that underpin those things and it's the same thing that I said in, a mas in, in some of my other videos that dealt with masculinity with the Gaston archetype if all you're manifesting is the outward stuff and there's nothing of substance beneath that that's toxic. So to only manifest the outward um, signs of femininity without actually having any of the values would constitute as toxic femininity. Because what you're doing is you're portraying the, the, the temptress, but you're doing this in a way that it doesn't facilitate growth. It just leads to destruction. So the Proverbs 39 woman works tirelessly and selflessly to maintain the structure that the masculine has created. But in the modern age, it seems that women are more interested in tearing it down and men are more interested in watching it fall. It is no coincidence that Galadriel has the ring Nenya and not Celeborn. The power of, of her ring is preservation and concealment from evil. That is the power of the feminine, and Galadriel uses it well. And that is part of what makes her such a brilliant character. She really is a fully actual, um, actualized and feminine woman. It's because we have clothed femininity in stereotypes, and we've come so far away from our understanding of it, and also partly because of our terrible understanding of history, that femininity has largely been regarded as weakness, which could not be further from the truth. And I hope that this video has given people something to think about, because um, it's, I think femininity has gotten a bad rep. Masculinity has definitely suffered, but I think a, a brutal attack has been made against femininity so much so to the point where for most people there is no concrete definition of femininity and it becomes a very uncomfortable topic to broach because no one really knows what we're referring to when we say femininity so yeah, that's the end of this video. I've spoken about the feminine journey and if you want to hear me speak about that, I've, I'm going to link 
the, the video about the feminine um, myth or journey w with Galadriel in the description. I'm also going to list the books and myths that I've referenced in here in the description as well. So I hope that you've enjoyed this video. Um, I hope that it wasn't too long and I didn't ramble on too much. But yeah, I hope you have a lovely day. This has been the Malaika Rights channel.